and showtime. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to another episode of the Channel Pro 5-Minute Roundup. We'll look at news, trends, and tips for the SMB channel in five minutes or thereabouts. My name is Rich Freeman. I am executive editor of the Channel Pro Network. I am also a co-host of this program. I am joined this week, as every week, by your other co-host, Eric Simpson, a business transformation and improvement consultant for MSPs and other IT providers. Eric, happy early 4th of July to you. And happy early 4th of July to you, Rich, as well, and to all of our viewers. It's going to be a, a good time to, you know, hopefully take a little time off and recharge and reflect. Uh, so I'm ready for it. I'm ready for it. I, I am too, very much so. So yeah, uh, happy 4th to the audience as well. I hope uh, everybody here has uh, some, some fun plans. And like Eric said, a little bit of uh, uh, recharging on the agenda as well coming up here uh, on this three-day weekend. Uh, well, let's dive into our story of the week here. Um, and, you know, this is a story, I'll, I'll tell you how it kind of um, affected me. I remember writing about this back in November when it first came, uh, became news in the industry. And then, to be totally honest, I kind of forgot about it ever since then. Back in November, word came out that tech data, you know, industry giant uh, of, of distribution. These days, they, they consider themselves a, a solutions aggregator, which is a little bit different, but a um, huge name in the industry. Uh, they, they announced in uh, November of last year they uh, are going to be acquired by Apollo Global Management, a very big private equity firm uh, that was going to take this uh, publicly listed company private and uh, invest in it and uh, turn it into another one of their investment properties. And um, it, it always takes a little bit of time after a deal like that is announced for it to actually be completed, but it actually didn't get completed until this week. So we learned this week that the deal is now, in fact, uh, final. Anybody who owned a share of uh, tech data stock, uh, common stock, got $145 for it. Um, and uh, this is a, a deal valued at about $6 billion, and Apollo Global Management owns uh, tech data right now. Now, if you are a tech data partner, um, this may or may not make you a little bit nervous. Obviously, private equity firms acquiring big names uh, in the industry, in the channel, this is nothing new. There's been a lot of this going on. This is certainly a bigger deal than a lot of the deals that we've seen, but uh, there's nothing particularly new about it. And every time one of these deals happens, the partners who rely on the acquired company often get a little bit of, uh, a little anxious about what this new owner might do. And in particular, might this new owner come in? And in this case, Apollo spent $6 billion. Are they gonna come in and look to cut costs to maybe um, you know, up the profitability quickly, recover some of, uh, of what they've invested in this company? And so what's interesting about the news this week, aside from the fact that it tells us this deal you know, is finally final, is that um, when Apollo announced that the deal was final, they also announced that they would be investing $750 million in tech data um, around various uh, digital transformation initiatives. So um, it, it, Tech Data has had these four kind of strategic pillars that they've been uh, guiding the business around for a number of different years now, and one of which was digital transformation and this idea that we're going to digitize manual processes, we're going to make our operational processes more efficient, uh, streamline them more agile, and that part of the this four pillar structure is apparently where that $750 billion is going. But I, I would say, you know, time will tell what effect uh, Apollo owning tech data will have on tech data. But the earliest sign has to be an encouraging one for tech data partners that far from looking for things to cut, uh, the first thing that Apollo talked about was actually putting $750 million into the business and investing in it. And there were also some hints dropped, I should say, that they may or may not have some acquisitions in mind potentially down the road and, uh, you know, augmenting what tech data can do today. Yeah, Rich, this really struck me as, <clears throat> you know, uh, you know, on the face of it and, and seeing these hints and clues and obviously and this step forward saying, hey, not only are we buying tech data, but, you know, we're all going to invest almost a billion dollars into it to improve operational efficiency and streamline processes and make it easier for partners to do business and whatnot, I thought, wow, yeah, we don't typically see that. And then you're, you know, at, at, when you start to, to appreciate that, and then these other hints about potentially making more acquisitions, you know, you get the sense for what a large strategy this really is. And, uh, you know, I think, um, yeah, when partners, you know, hear about something happening with, with a, a, such a big strategic, you know, partner, distributor of theirs, 
being acquired and things, the first thought typically will go to, you know, the FUD factor, fear, uncertainty, and doubt. What's going to happen? You know, how am I going to be impacted? So it'll also be interesting to track, you know, tech data's communication and, and positioning of this move. Obviously, it'll all be positive, right? But, you know, how much detail are they going to give the partners, you know, to, to quell some of that FUD uh, over time? So, yeah, very unique very, uh, I think, strategic, and obviously larger strategies at play here. Yeah, and it would, it would be fascinating to, to get the Apollo perspective on that, the, the strategic play here. And, you know, the, there were rumors, that we, we've spoken about this before, but, you know, uh, at least allegedly Apollo attempted to buy Ingram Micro uh, at one point in time before deciding to buy tech data instead. I mean, they clearly see um, potential in that distribution space right now, and they, you know, they're willing to make huge investments to to pursue that potential. So it would actually be really interesting to, to know what the play is that they have in mind in terms of you know what they can turn tech data into. Uh, but uh, yeah, no, it'll, it'll it'll definitely be something for us to uh, to monitor as we go down the road and to see are there also other changes in the business that maybe have a negative impact from partners, and if not. Um, where and when do partner tech data partners begin to feel the effects, the benefits of that $750 million investment? Does it become easier to do business with them? Does it uh, impact things like uh, pricing uh, and so on in, in meaningful ways? Uh, it, it, another interesting thing to keep an eye on. Yeah, you know, their, their position in terms of market share will, will, will tell the tale over time, right? Absolutely. Well, let's take a look at your uh, tip of the week here, Eric. Um, and, uh, you know, it has to do with uh, an issue that a lot of channel pros struggle with, which is getting into a conversation with their customers about price. Absolutely, Rich. And, you know, I, <clears throat> you know, as I was determining which topic to share this week uh, on the tip of the week, you know, I, I had a couple others in mind. And I thought, you know, well, you know, how effective is, is you know, talking about how not to negotiate on price and tactics and strategies to, to help when uh, prospects and clients want to negotiate you on your price. And I thought, you know what, I have enough evidence of partners actually thriving during this, you know, coronavirus scenario that we've got going on. And also to think that, you know, there's never a bad time to talk about, you know, how to strengthen our capability in terms of maintaining our margins and, and ensuring that we're, that we're properly reflecting the value of every single service we deliver to our prospects and clients. So, so yes, we're going to talk about how to, uh, to succeed uh, and, and, and be on the right side of a price negotiation when your prospects or clients kind of demand it or force you into this role. And I think this is especially appropriate for maybe new sales professionals uh, and new business owners that begin, you know, to build their businesses because, you know, we're still honing our, our tech, our, uh, our expertise in, in developing our value proposition and maintaining, you know, the value of our services. So the first thing, uh, there's really two simple points here. The first point is to understand what the, what the budget uh, expectation looks like. So, you know, when we're presenting a project to a prospect or a client, let's say, always, always, always ask the budget question during qualifying. And, you know, Rich, a lot of times I've worked with enough sales folks in the industry uh, and, and MSPs and business owners uh, and IT pros to know that there's just something that sometimes folks just feel awkward asking the budget question. And I want to dispel, you know, the, the anticipation and the, and, and, and the nervousness around it. You just got to find a simple way to weave the budget question into conversation. Just as if you're asking a client about their infrastructure and their security needs, and you're being very matter of fact about it, you know, there's several simple ways to ask the budget question. For instance, I'll give an easy one. So, how, you know, if we decide to move forward, uh, Mr. Freeman, you and I, how will our, you know, initiative be funded, right? Do you already have budget set aside or is it something that we've got to find, right? It's just a simple question. Take the, 
you know, don't build it up. If you build up any question you're asking a prospect during the sales uh, process, they'll build it up in their mind too and think there's a lot, you know, around that. There, there isn't really a lot around it. So, you know, you may say, hey, um, you know, uh, how, what kind of a budget um, are you able to set aside or have you thought about it, right? Now, in many cases, some prospects may not even know what budget, you know, they should uh, allocate to it. And in those cases, you've got a kind of art and science and you're fishing a little bit. And here's where, you know, you get into some deep water, but if you're, you know, if you're adept, you'll ask a question such as, or you'll say something like, if they say, look, I have no idea, what, what do you think? Well, Rich, you know, with other clients that we've worked with and you're in similar situations, you know, it's not apples and apples exactly, but for a company your size to do a project like this, we've seen budget requirements fall between X and Y. Now, is that something that we can try to find budget for? So give a range, right? You don't want to be too precise because you never know what's hiding in the closet, right? But you set an expectation with a client. Now, if they come back and say something like, oh, wow, that's way outside of, you know, our budget, at least you know you're outside the range. And then you can follow up and say, well, what kind of budget can you put together? And you know what? Maybe we don't attack it this quarter. Maybe it's something we do next quarter. So you're asking more questions to try to qualify that. But at least you know how close you are. Some you know, prospects will say, yeah, I think we can, we can probably work toward the bottom end of that or maybe be in the middle, somewhere like that. What this does is immediately allows me to, pr to create a proposal that is not going to create sticker shock for the prospect when I present it. Because you know, I've got a sense for what they're comfortable with. Then if I can scope my solution around that um, so that it fits their budget, then that's one bite of the apple. Maybe it's a longer process. I know it's gonna take two or three phases to get this done. Maybe I present it as the first phase, the highest priority things are this, which can fit within your budget. Uh, Mr. Freeman, if I can present it to you in that manner, is it possible to find additional budget the next couple of quarters so that we can attack the entire problem that way. And if you say yes, then I know how I can scope this out now and I can present it in bite-sized chunks that you're comfortable with. Now, the most important question that I'm going to want to ask you when I come back with my proposal and my sales presentation phase of the sales process is, Rich, has anything changed since we spoke last? Right? Some prospects say, oh, yes, this happened. I had a client tell me one time, oh, yeah, the boiler, you know, failed on the roof. And, you know, we've, we had to go and spend money to fix that. My follow-up then is, well, has that impacted the budget that we had set aside for this project? If the answer is yes, I do not present my sales proposal because it's, it's fruitless. I now go back to requalify. Okay, Rich, we initially needed this much how much do we have available now? Maybe I have to phase this out differently, or maybe um, I get a commitment to next quarter, we'll have the budget and we come back. At least I'm not giving you sticker shock when I present and I'm formulating another strategy. Now, the opposite has happened to me many times as well, where the client has said, yes, something you know, has changed since we spoke last. And oh, really, what, what has changed? We've decided to open up another office. Oh, guess what? That's positive for me now, right? So am I going to present my proposal the way I had planned it? No, I'm going to now requalify and ask more questions about the new office and then include that in my revised proposal. Obviously, I'm gonna ask for budget for that as well and then I'm going to address it that way. Now, let's say that we do all of these things correctly, Rich, and the prospect or the client still wants to negotiate on price at the end of the day. Well, yeah, I know I said that, but I, you know, I want to think about it, right? That's a telltale sign that there's some underlying, you know, root cause of the objection. I want to think about it as very vague. It's probably one of the easiest objections to overcome. All we've got to do is ask, well, Rich, what is it you want to think about? Is it, you know, this feature of the, of, of the project? Is it this outcome of the project? And as I ask questions about every single thing and every positive benefit, and you say, no, I really, that's not what I want to think about. 
I'm going to finally get to the point where most of these discussions go. Rich, let's be honest with each other. Is it the budget? You know, is it the budget that we want to think about? Yes, it's the budget. Okay, great. Let's talk about that. So now they want to negotiate on price. So the first thing that I do is I say, well, let's take a look. What are you comfortable with? And if you really aren't being very open about it, then what I'll say, so are we, you know, you want us, do you, you want to see if I could sharpen my pencil and by how much? If you say something to me like, hey, a few thousand dollars, this or that, I'll say, great, then let's take a look at what we've specked out that we both agreed that we need and figure out what we can remove. You see what I did there? I didn't negotiate on price straight up. I said, let's look at what we've agreed to that you need, right? Because that was an agreement and see what potentially we can remove from the proposal to get you that savings. Now, of course, as a good sales professional, I'm going to talk about the feature and positive benefit of every single thing. Well, Rich, you really don't want to remove this, right? Because we talked about how important that was. Is that right? Yes. And as I go through every single item in that proposal, I'm going to remind you of the value of it and then ask you and encourage you not to remove it, right? We don't want to remove that, do we? So at the end, I just want to exhaust you into saying, you know what, Eric, you're right. I need all of it. Let's just move forward. And that has occurred more than 85% of the time for me when I've taken that approach. Now, sometimes the they just don't feel comfortable and will remove something, even though, you know, I really, you know, stand against removing it. But at least in that approach, I'm strengthening the impression on my client or my prospect that every single thing that I deliver has value. And it costs me money to deliver it. And it gives you positive benefit from receiving it. So by not simply just saying, all right, I'll give you the, you know, the new customer 10% discount today. That works against us later because now the client, just like anyone else that is a buyer, thinks, oh, well, how much margin are they making on this stuff where they can just shave 10% off? Could I have asked for 20%, right? So that's how to avoid negotiating on price. And when you do get into a, a negotiation on price, you know going in it's because something has changed and you have a chance to revise your proposal or Prove the value of everything that's in the proposal. We're not simply throwing things in just because we want to make money. It's because we're scoping the correct solution that we believe is in the best interest of the prospect. And so when they start asking for a reduction in, in price, I'm going to go to what is it that you would like to remove? So that's the tip of the week. Yeah, you know, and, and um, what's interesting about it, I mean, in, in a sense, um, if push comes to shove, you can negotiate on price, but you never negotiate on is margin. So, I mean, essentially, you know, if, if you're talking to a customer whose budget is such that they cannot afford to do what it is that you agreed to do before, well, then you can look at all those items and remove things um, so that, you know, the, the deal size maybe goes down, but the margin kind of stays the same. But that margin is never negotiable in, in the model that you're talking about. Um, and, you know, the, the other thing that occurs to me, and this occurred to me when um, you, you mentioned uh, before we recorded here that you were, this was going to be your topic of the week, your tip of the week, is, you know, I, my first thought was a, a great way to make sure that you never negotiate on price is to never compete on price, which is a different topic, but also kind of important, you know, price really shouldn't be the foremost uh, conversation you're having with the customer. And as long as you're not making it um, a big part of the conversation that, you know, you're halfway to avoiding a price related negotiation. No, you make some very valid points, Rich. And, and you try to offset the potential for that to happen by doing things during the qualifying process, by trying to get an agreement on a budget number and get to as close as you can to it. And then, of course, again, you know, the, the checkpoint before you present is to ask, you know, has anything changed and then respond accordingly. Um, but yeah, you're right. It's all about margin, margin protection. And, uh, you know, I guess the takeaway here is the number one best way to not negotiate on price is simply to walk in with that mindset is, look, I'm not negotiating on price. Everything I've scoped here is what I feel is, is what the client needs. And I'm not egregiously, you know, trying to you know, make uh, an unrealistic type of a profit on this. I mean, if we're, you know, true to our to our instinct about building long-term business relationships and wanting to continue and grow those over time, you know, those kinds of tactics never win in, in, in 
that, uh, you know, in that strategy. All right. Well, that uh, leaves us with time for just one more story this week. And, uh, you know, I tell you, the best laid plans. At, at an earlier point in my career, I, I worked in marketing, actually, and so I can relate to how this sort of thing can happen. Uh, this is a, a story that's coming to us from South Korea, uh, and it concerns or at least originates with a marketing campaign that was planned and executed about 16 years ago. Uh, and this was a, a campaign for Czech cereal uh, out there, and they had the idea that they were going to create a, a special limited edition flavor of Czech. Uh, and the, the concept for the, the campaign basically was that they, they would allow uh, um, consumers to vote on which of these two flavors should be the one that they, they create. And one of them was a, a chocolate flavored Czech cereal, and the other was a green onion flavored cereal. And there were like cartoon characters that they created for each one of these options, and they put this out to a vote, assuming that the chocolate one would just win in a landslide, and that would be part of the fun and the funniness of this campaign. The, the South Korean people did not cooperate. Uh, it was actually the green onion uh, flavor that, that won this competition. And uh, for 16 long years, the people who voted uh, in that election have been waiting for their green onion cereal. It just never came because the Czechs people were like, we can't possibly do this. But finally, they have come through. This week, they have finally introduced a green onion flavored Czech cereal in South Korea. They've made good on their promise. You know what I love best about that story, Rich, is even after doing so, and they're they're surveying the folks that have bought the, that green onion flavored Czech cereal, and I remember the one person, you know, that they highlighted their comment was, yeah, doesn't have enough green onion flavor. <laughs> I mean, come on, that's breakfast cereal, man. <laughs> Who knew that, uh, that there was such a thing as enough green onion uh, in your breakfast cereal? But um, I, I don't know. Now uh, we'll see. This you know this story has gotten some play here in the U.S. I mean, do do American consumers now start demanding their green onion breakfast cereal? Uh, we'll we'll see. Because uh, I would be uh, curious to know is is it as disgusting as I think it is? Yeah. Now I I do love me some you know Czech snack mix with all those you know really you know interesting flavors. But yeah, not something I pour milk on and have for breakfast. <laughs> well, folks, that is all the time we have this week on the 5-Minute Roundup. Thank you so much for uh, joining us for this show here. If you like the show, you want to take a look at uh, some of the episodes you may have missed in the past, keep up with the new ones when they become available, best thing to do is go to the Channel Pro Network channel on YouTube and subscribe to that channel. Make sure you click that little bell icon if you want to get notifications when the new episodes go up. Uh, you want to read more about tech data getting acquired by Apollo Global Management. You want to get all sorts of great business growth advice for your company. The place to go is channelpronetwork.com because uh, we have got awesome new content for you every day there. To learn more about Eric and the work that he does with his clients, you should go to ericsimpson.com. That's E-R-I-C-K Simpson.com. Uh, so folks, uh, once again, thank you for joining us. We're going to be back next week with another episode. Uh, until then, please enjoy the rest of your week, your holiday week. Eric and I are enjoying the rest of your holiday week already. <laughs>